On May 27, 1999, Space Shuttle Discovery launched STS-96 into orbit with the Space Hab double module and an integrated cargo carrier with various parts for the International Space Station. system is now activating. T minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, and liftoff of Space Shuttle Discovery on the first mission to dock with the orbiting International Space Station. And the vehicle has cleared the tower. Space to Discovery roll program. Roger roll, Discovery. Houston now controlling, roll maneuver complete, Discovery now in a heads down, wings level position, headed to a 173 nautical mile orbit, inclined 51.6 degrees to either side of the equator. Engines now throttling down to 67% of rated thrust as the orbiter passes through the area of maximum aerodynamic pressure. Three engines now back up at 104%. Roger, go at throttle up. Roger, Houston, go at throttle up. Discovery's three liquid fuel engines now back at full throttle, 104% of rated thrust. Altitude now eight and a half miles, downrange six miles. One minute, 30 seconds into the flight with more than two and a quarter million pounds of propellant having already been used, Discovery now weighs half of what it did at liftoff. Standing by for the next major event, which will be the burnout and separation of the two solid rocket boosters that occur in a little more than two minutes into flight. Booster officer confirms good separation of the solid rocket boosters. As soon as we're on orbit, we open the payload bay doors for cooling. That's another major milestone. If they don't open, we can't stay and have to come back. On May 29th, Discovery made the first docking with the ISS. Commander Kent Rominger eased the shuttle into a textbook lineup with Unity's pressurized mating adapter 2 as the orbiter and the ISS flew over the Russian Kazakh border. The 45th spacewalk in space shuttle history 
and the fourth of the ISS era lasted seven hours and 55 minutes, making it the second longest ever conducted. Tamara Jernigan and Daniel Berry transferred a US-built crane called the Orbital Transfer Device and parts of the Russian crane Strela from the shuttle's payload bay and attached them to locations outside the station. The astronauts also installed two new portable foot restraints that would fit both American and Russian space boots and attached three bags filled with tools and handrails that would be used during future assembly operations. The cranes and tools fastened to the outside of the station totaled 662 pounds. Once those primary tasks were accomplished, Jernigan and Barry installed an insulating cover on a Turian pin on the Unity module, documented painting surfaces on both Unity and Zarya, and inspected one of the two early communication systems, or ECOM, antennas on the Unity. During the incursion inside the ISS, Barry and Rick Husband replaced the power distribution unit and transceiver for the ECOM in the Unity module, restoring that system to its full capability. Julie Payetti and Valery Ivanovich Tokarev replaced 18 battery recharge controllers in the Russian-built Zarya module, and Barry and Tokarev also installed a series of mufflers over fans inside Zarya to reduce the noise. The mufflers caused some air circulating ductwork to collapse, and Romingers sent down a video inspection of the mufflers. The crew transferred 3,567 pounds of material, including clothing, sleeping bags, spare parts, medical equipment, supplies, hardware, and about 84 gallons of water to the interior of the station. The astronauts also installed parts of a wireless strain gauge system that would help engineers track the effects of adding modules to the station throughout its assembly. They also cleaned filters and checked smoke detectors. 18 items weighing 197 pounds were moved from the station to Discovery for a return back to Earth. The astronauts spent a total of 79 hours 30 minutes inside the station before closing the final hatch on the orbiting outpost. Rominger and Husband commanded a series of 17 pulses of Discovery's reaction control system jets to boost the station's orbit. After spending 5 days, 18 hours, and 17 minutes linked to the station, Discovery undocked at 6.39 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time as Husband fired Discovery's jets to move to a distance of about 400 feet for a two and a half lap fly round. The crew used the fly around to make a detailed photographic record of the ISS. After the fly around, mission specialist Payetti deployed the Starshine satellite from the orbiter's cargo bay. The spherical reflective object entered into an orbit two miles below Discovery. The small probe became instantly visible from Earth as part of a project allowing more than 25,000 students from 18 countries to track its progress. Then Discovery made its deorbit burn and returned to Earth. During the re-entry, the view out the window is just fantastic. It, it was uh, amazing to see the glow out the overhead windows, and here if we look over uh, the commander's uh, shoulder out his windows, the different color that you see is uh, pink and orange and yellow. We made our landing at Kennedy Space Center at night, and this is what the uh, views were from some infrared cameras that were tracking us as we came around to line up with the runway, as you see out uh, in front of the orbiter. You still see the nose cone 
glowing from the heat that it's absorbed during the entry. We get the gear down at about 300 feet above the ground and then shallow out our descent to come in and touch down at about 200 knots. And we made uh, a very smooth as silk landing as we touched down here on the runway. And then as we roll out, we deploy a drag chute to help us slow down and uh, come to a stop. We lower the nose to the runway and then get lined up with the center line as you see the lights here in the video and uh, jettison the drag chute and, and then uh, eventually use the, the wheel brakes to come to a complete stop. We had a fantastic mission. Our crew motto during our, our training was if you're not having fun, you're not doing it right. And you can tell by the smiles on all our faces that we had a lot of fun on this mission and uh, had a great time. The next flight to the ISS was Shuttle Atlantis, sending STS-101 to the station Five, on May 19, 2000. Seven, six, main engine start, four, three, two, one, and liftoff of Space Shuttle Atlantis, a space shuttle for the 21st century. Houston is now controlling the flight of Atlantis. Roger roll, Atlantis. The roll maneuver is complete. Atlantis is now in a heads down, wings level position, headed toward a rendezvous with the International Space Station. Twenty-eight seconds into the flight, Atlantis's engines are now throttling down to 72% of rated thrust as the orbiter passes through the area of maximum aerodynamic pressure. Atlantis currently at an altitude of 3.6 miles, about two and a half miles downrange from the Kennedy Space Center. All systems on board are performing well. Atlantis, go at throttle up. Copy, go at throttle up. Atlantis's three liquid-fueled engines are now back at full throttle, 104% of rated thrust. Atlantis now at an altitude of nine miles, downrange from the Kennedy Space Center at six miles. Atlantis traveling now at a speed of about 1,600 miles per hour at an altitude of 14 miles and downrange from the Kennedy Space Center, 10 and a half miles. All systems on board are continuing to perform well. One minute and 48 seconds into the flight, Atlantis now downrange from the Kennedy Space Center, 22 miles at an altitude of 24 miles. The next major event will be the burnout and separation of the twin solid rocket boosters. The booster officer confirms good separation of the two solid rocket boosters. Atlantis now at an altitude of 34 miles, downrange from the Kennedy Space Center, 42 miles, 2 minutes and 25 seconds into powered flight. Atlantis, two-engine tail. Copy, two-engine tail. Call that Miko, and then there's another loud explosion, and the external tank, this amazing footage here shows the external tank leaving us and uh, we will fly up and away from the tank and you'll get a great shot here of the uh, tank going below us before it re-enters and look at the uh, burn marks on the bottom of the tank and the scorch marks from the engines. STS-101 delivered supplies to the International Space Station, hauled up using a Space Hab double module and the integrated cargo carrier pallet.
here, the last few feet. That's the International Space Station at the top half of the screen. That's us in the shuttle in the lower half of the screen. Our approach speed is about one inch per second. Uh, my task is to fly inside the three inch circle and uh, it all worked exactly as we have been trained. The crew performed a spacewalk and then reboosted the station from 370 kilometers to 400 kilometers. Detailed objectives included ISS ingress and safety, to take air samples, monitor carbon dioxide, deploy portable personal fans, measure airflow, rework and modify ISS ducting, replace air filters, and replace Zarya fire extinguishers and smoke detectors. Critical replacements, repairs, and spares were done to replace four suspect batteries on Zarya, to replace failed or suspect electronics for Zarya's batteries, to replace radio telemetry system memory units, replace port early communications antennas, replace radio frequency power distribution box, and clear the space vision system target. The mission also included incremental assembly and upgrades, such as the assembly of the Strela crane, installation of additional exterior handrails, setup of centerline camera cable, installation of the Comparis cable inserts, and reseating the US crane. Assembly parts, tools, and equipment were all transferred from the station, and equipment was stowed for future missions. The station was also resupplied with water a docking mechanism accessory kit, film and videotape for documentation, office supplies, and other personal items. Crew health maintenance items were also transferred, including exercise equipment, medical support supplies, formaldehyde monitor kit, and a passive dosimetry system. After undocking from the station and beginning to return to Earth, the mission was almost similar to the Columbia disaster. A damaged tile seam caused by a breach allowed superheated gas to enter the left wing during re-entry. Thankfully, the gas did not penetrate deeply and the damage was repaired before the next flight. If it had penetrated deeply, the shuttle would have been destroyed during re-entry. However, Discovery made a landing back on Earth. The next launch to the ISS would add a third module, the Svezda, to the International Space Station. 